Vesuvius, or Mount Vesuvius, erupted on August 24th in the year 79. No, not 1979, but literally the year 79. And that eruption is considered one of the most terrifying volcanic disasters in history. It was so powerful that the three nearby Roman cities, Pompeii, Herculaneum, and Stabiae, along with several smaller settlements, were buried under lava and ash, causing the deaths of about 2,000 people. Because the last moments of the victims were preserved in the ash, we have a very clear picture of what happened that day. Of course, thanks to written accounts by authors like Pliny the Younger, we also have a decent understanding of events. However, new genetic research now suggests we may have misinterpreted parts of the 79 CE eruption. In this text, I'll recount the story of that terrible eruption, one that left unforgettable traces in history, and reveal a previously untold detail, as well as discuss how modern science has changed our views. Let's begin. The morning of August 24th in 79 started out like any other in Pompeii, though the exact date of the catastrophe remains debated, and it could have been late October or early November. For the sake of the story, however, we'll assume it was August 24th. On that day, homes, particularly the private estates called Domus, came to life early in the morning. As the sun rose over the Bay of Naples, slaves would prepare breakfast for their owners and sweep the sunlit courtyards where homeowners gathered to plan their day. Breakfast was usually a simple meal of bread, fruit, cheese, and a bit of honey or olive oil. If a household was rich, it could include eggs, fish, or even cold meats, all served with watered-down wine. Craftsmen began working clay, iron, and textiles at first light, while the communal forum areas brought together people of every social class. Streets filled with merchants and farmers selling fresh produce and baked bread, their cries echoing much like a modern-day market. The air brimmed with the smell of freshly baked bread, newly caught fish, herbs laid out on stalls, and a tang from the local blacksmiths. Public baths welcomed wealthy patrons for social rituals. Temples drew worshippers with burning incense. Preparations for gladiatorial games and theatrical shows carried on. Then came another earthquake. Small tremors had been felt for days, but this region was known for quakes, and few suspected that Vesuvius, a volcano dormant for centuries, could erupt. Some ancient sources, like the Greek geographer Strabo, had noted its ashy, burned-looking summit, and Pliny the Elder had documented possible geologic events in detail. But Romans at the time still saw Vesuvius as a lush mountain essential for local agriculture. In those days, the link between earthquakes and volcanic activity was not well understood, and the destructive 62 CE quake, which never triggered an eruption, further encouraged complacency. As a result, the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum continued their vibrant daily lives, unaware that Vesuvius was on the brink of a massive eruption. Formed by the subduction of the African plate beneath the Eurasian plate and part of the Campanian volcanic arc, Vesuvius had spent centuries accumulating pressure in its magma chamber, which was filled with a highly viscous, gas-rich silicate magma. In August of 79, the system reached a critical level, and around 1 p.m. the volcano erupted more violently than any Roman had ever witnessed, sending a massive column of ash and pumice kilometers into the sky and blotting out the sun. Stones rained down, injuring people and damaging buildings. A strong sulfur odor made breathing difficult. Amid thunderous explosions, some people fled with pillows or cloth over their heads, while others took shelter at home, hoping the structures would protect them. Ash and pumice fell through the night and by the next day the eruption intensified, unleashing deadly pyroclastic flows of superheated gas and volcanic material that raced down Vesuvius's slopes. In Herculaneum, victims died instantly from heat topping 300 degrees Celsius, entombed under ash and mud. Subsequent waves reached Pompeii, flattening it in hours and killing thousands. Once the eruption subsided, a thick layer of volcanic debris sealed buildings, artifacts, and victims' final moments, preserving them for future generations. Excavations revealed plaster casts made by pouring plaster into the cavities left by vaporized bodies, providing chilling snapshots of people in their last moments. Some curled in fetal positions, others clutching loved ones or trying to shield themselves. Herculaneum, meanwhile, yielded mostly skeletal remains, as the intense heat there carbonized the victims' bones. Archaeologists discovered many skeletons near the ancient shoreline, 
where people had likely sought boats to flee. These casts and remains gave rise to various speculative stories, like the Golden Bracelet family and the Two Virgins, based on the body's positions, objects, and facial expressions. Yet recent genomic studies published in Current Biology by researchers from Harvard and the University of Florence have begun to overturn these long-held assumptions, showing that some individuals assumed to be women were actually men, while others were not related as previously believed. One supposed mother-child pair turned out to be genetically unrelated and both male. Likewise, the two virgins could be two men, and the pregnant woman might have been neither pregnant nor even female. These findings also suggest that some died from head trauma rather than suffocation, and that Pompeii was more cosmopolitan than once believed, with individuals hailing from the Eastern Mediterranean and Levant. Science, in its self-correcting nature, has refined these stories, which were originally our best educated archaeological guesses. As new data emerges, our understanding improves. Of course, current research could also contain errors, and further independent studies are needed, but for now, these are the clearest facts we can establish. Future investigations may reveal even more, so we'll simply have to wait and see.